The CDC says the average cost of caring for a positive person who is in treatment, on medication, getting their labs, the whole thing, and they're doing fine, they're healthy. Mm -hmm. The average cost of that is $29,200 a year per person. Every new infection costs a minimum of $796,000. Consumers. That's what people with HIV are, consumers of HIV services. For all I know, it could be keeping me sick and just getting my money because it's a pharmaceutical company. Anyone who has been diagnosed with HIV is probably aware of the many facets to maintaining this virus. Considering how many people are infected with HIV globally, it isn't a surprise that there's a huge industry built and evolving around it. From the pharmaceutical industry, healthcare facilities, health insurance, specialized doctors, scientific research, cure research and development, nonprofit agencies, and so on, there is a network of HIV and AIDS related companies that have created what we understand as AIDS Inc. I don't give a shit if people know about this. So in New York City, when you have AIDS and you're technically homeless, the city will pay for you to find an apartment or live in a residential hotel. So first I moved into a hotel, which was horrible. And I did my time on Maple Drive, as I like to call it. And I wrote it out for seven months and I was on a waiting list and I was picked by an agency called the Doe Fund, which happens to be two blocks around the corner here. And they found me my first apartment in the Bronx and it was $900 a month and the city paid for it. And the city gives me $200 a month in food stamps and they give me $200 a month in cash. AIDS ended up being my, my saving grace. Wow. You know? That is amazing. Okay, my floors are slanted. Whatever. I get to put groovy shit on my walls. At the moment, South Africa is a third world country. And we are still, it is still draining our Department of Health to access um, treatment for everyone in South Africa. In countries like India, that are making generic forms and they are basically supplying other countries. But because we have patent laws that, were dis that are, have been placed there by greedy pharmaceutical companies that have put restrictions on us being able to import from other countries, we are still paying exorbitant amount of money to access treatment. And if we carry on like this, we are going to find, we are actually exhausting our funds. And if we could bring that down, it would make access to treatment so much quicker, so much more affordable, and we will not be faced with the number of stockouts, for instance, that we, we, we experienced in a lot of areas such as the Eastern Cape, Limpopo, which are more rural. Areas like that, that are rural, kind of like fall off the ladder and everything gets there late. So it's more of a challenge now to make accessing treatment as easy and as affordable as possible. Everything changed from being a community to being uh, providers and clients. Not to mention how many people were both, right? But providers and clients does not make a community. Okay, yeah. well, we can talk a little bit more about this AIDS Inc. This, because it is real. And I, I, I think it's a reality that a lot of people aren't aware of. What, where do you, what do you see it as? Well, and I'm not talking about nationally. I'm not talking about like PEPFAR or NGOs or anything like that. I'm just talking about here in the States. Mm -hmm. um, sort of the network of HIV services that originally were, you know, hey gang, let's put on a show, you know, kind of things um, to help people with whatever they needed, now are, you know, multi-million dollar service agencies like, you know, not as big as the United Way, but, you know, seriously. Mm -hmm. And they have a lot of political clout and they're totally grant funded. Grant funding, while the money is really great mm -hmm. for some things, um, dictates everything. There's the concept of AIDS exceptionalism. Um, what does that mean? Sort of like, of, you know, I mean, with HIV that I know of, we're like the only, I want to say community, but say the only illness, like public health illness, 
where you get housing and bus passes and Section 8 and food banks and transportation and pet support and everything like that. Um, people with diabetes or cancer don't really have access to that sort of thing. Mm. And they call it exceptionalism because they say it's, HIV is exceptional. If it isn't prevented, like if, you know, if your mom has cancer, she's not going to pass it on to anybody. Right. right. She doesn't need prevention education to prevent, you know, it isn't going to be passed on hereditarily or socially, right, like that. Um, with HIV, there's the public health implication of if you don't take care of yourself, we have to force, we have to take care of you for you mm-hmm. because it's not just you, it's everyone you have sex with or everyone you share needles with or whatever. Oh, right. So, we have to. so there's this additional public health imperative, yeah. We have this bittersweet flavor in our mouths. The sweetness is, yes, do you realize we were in the leading edge and HIV transformed the way clinical virology is performed? No doubt about it. And I can say proudly that I was one of the actors. I was there, you know. The bitterness is the fact that HIV is still around. We don't have a vaccine. That is the real problem. But all I can say <clears throat> is we try damn hard. We weren't useless. If we don't have a vaccine, it's because it's going to be very hard to get. And as you know, we don't have a good vaccine against mal- we don't have a vaccine against malaria, and we don't have a vaccine against tuberculosis, and we still don't have a vaccine against hepatitis C. The easy vaccines are made. You know about them. You've been vaccinated by them. The hard ones, well, they're the hard ones. And HIV happens to be one of the hard ones. I admire these um, clinicians who day in, day out, they've got the guts to face up to these people who are getting thinner and thinner and thinner. The reality is it's, it's always been a challenge in terms of finding new drugs, getting medications to people. Um, and whether or not these medications are beneficial. My patients are primarily uninsured or poorly insured. The, the more people wait to get into care, the more likely it is that they will suffer from more difficult to treat and more expensive to treat opportunistic infections and cancers and other sorts of problems. Mm. Um, and so it is much more cost effective <laughs> to identify people who need care and to just get them onto the medications, which are far cheaper than the kind of operations right. and, and kind of long term, you know, kind of uh, intensive care that people need if they're not in treatment. chemicals, I don't know what they are that I'm putting into my body. I mean, for all I know, it could be keeping me sick and just getting my money because it's a, a pharmaceutical company. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, and, and there's no reason why historically in this country or any really that we should be trusting the pharmaceutical company. No, no, not at all. And did you like grow up with a relationship about or like a thought about prescription medication or is it something that you have? No, I developed that partly after my dad got sick and after seeing all the medication that he was on. Just the amount of money he spent per month was, and they even had health insurance. With health insurance? With health insurance. Was like. Do you have health insurance? No. Okay, so with health insurance you saw this happening to you. With health insurance. I saw it happening to my dad. And how, many, how much medication was he on during the course of his illness? Ridiculous. Ridiculous. I mean, he looked like he was an 85-year-old person taking their supplements. You know what I mean? You know how old people are? I mean, they have like a whole cup full. I have to come to terms that I might be on medication for the rest of my life. You said you that you, know, you have to be sick enough to, get, to be on medication. It's kind of like waiting for a new liver. 
to be honest. I mean, I correlate it to my dad's illness. There's three stages, and he hovered in the middle stage. He can never get to that final top tier of like, okay, he needs a new liver, and he needs it a month from now, and blah, blah, blah. What's your version of a new liver, then? A cure. Where do you think we are with that? I'm hopeful that we'll find one, but at the same time, I'm so bitter and jaded. We have all the tools together here in this hallway to make a cure for HIV possible, and I hope it's going to happen not too long from now. People say it's a chronic disease that can be treated with taking medication chronically for the rest of your life right. and pay the money. Pay that money. Mm -hmm. Right. A lot of people have been talking about cure research lately. Right. And there has been a little bit of a resurgence of cure research. But I think it is not as big as just taking drugs. And uh, therefore, we're still plugging along, trying to find funding, and not giving up. Can you talk about the, I don't even want to say dilemma, but can you talk about the politics of working yeah. in stem cell research mm -hmm. here in the United States? Yeah. So. We have been doing stem cell research as long as I've been involved in it, and we didn't think anything of it because we took bone marrow stem cells from the patient, mm -hmm. we put anti-HIV genes in, and we put them back into the patient, and that's stem cell research, isn't it? So what we can do is we can put a human immune system into a mouse, and this human immune system is actually completely resistant to HIV. So Dr. Anderson engineered these human cells, we can put them into a mouse, and we can make a mouse have a human immune system, and we can recapitulate HIV in that mouse. And we can show that we can actually cure the mouse of HIV. Interestingly, when I worked in Los Angeles, I had a friend that suddenly called me up and, I, and he said, oh, I saw your clinical trial coverage on the news. You have treated another patient. But I just wanted to let you know that people are saying, oh, this guy is using stem cells. You should be careful with that. I didn't even know what he was talking about at that time. Whoa, so you didn't even realize that you were working in this, in a, this little... In a field that would become dark. What they were confusing was embryonic type stem cells. There's the adult type stem cell that we get from a patient or from the umbilical cord of, of a baby. The controversial type stem cell is the embryonic type stem cell that comes from a three-day-old embryo. It's not a stem cell anymore afterwards. This is the stem cell that makes all types of tissues. These stem cells were generated by in vitro fertilization for couples that couldn't get any babies. And it's from discarded in vitro fertilization procedures. The adult type stem cell can make only certain types of tissue. The blood forming stem cell makes blood. Okay. We also have mesenchymal stem cells that make cartilage, bone, fat, muscle, things like that. Okay. They can also be used for regenerative purposes. They make also more blood vessels. If, if this is done right, and they can protect neurons, but they cannot make neurons. They cannot make heart. They cannot make liver, and they cannot make kidney. So you can't go like m making hearts. You can't yeah. go making Not with adult type stem cells. Them, no. You can maybe even help repair it, but it's not because you make new heart. But adult type stem cells can perform some repair functions, no doubt about it, and are very, very useful for many purposes and are being applied in the clinic already and every day. But with embryonic stem cells? They can make all can. the other tissues. We can make neurons. Like for spinal cord injuries, for brain injuries, things like that, we may be able to grow a new heart, may be able to grow a new liver out of them, okay? So the research is on the way. However, since it was so controversial, there's people that said, why can't we make a third type of embryonic type stem cells that made, that's made from your own cells? That's called induced pluripotent stem cells. So you can take a skin cell and reprogram that cell with gene therapy that I told you before, with the insertion of a particular type of gene therapy vector with factors that will tell that cell, you are an embryonic type stem cell. You can make it out of your cells. You can recode it. You can, you can reprogram that cell you are and make it. Yeah, I keep hypnosis, you know. <laughs> 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 wow. No, it's not hypnosis, of course. <laughs> it's hardcore science. And Yamanaka in, in Japan, Dr. Yamanaka, discovered that. It's one of the largest good manufacturing practice facilities in Northern California. When you have something that's 
to get the skilled personnel to actually do it. So what I do is I train them. So it is my purpose in life now as a professor to train the future stem cell scientists and the scientists that will be able to come up with these cells for the people. the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, which is the country's real fantastic stem cell funding organization voted in by the people of California. Yeah. Really, and it's, it's, has made California the, the, really the state with the, the most stem cell research. And we're on the forefront of stem cell research due to CERM and the foresight of the people. Here at the NRS, we have a specific cohort of HIV-infected patients, which is called the Visconti cohort. And these patients were treated very early on in their HIV infection, mm. and they had continued and prolonged antiretroviral therapy. Mm. They have this subgroup of patients then interrupted their treatment, and now they have been off treatment for a up to 10 years wow. and they're successfully able to control the viral infection and the viral replication even in the absence of therapy. Mm -hmm. So it's really a case of trying to identify what are the characteristics of these particular individuals mm -hmm. and could there be other people who were treated very early on in infection mm -hmm. who display the same capabilities of controlling the virus even in the absence of therapy. I'm taking Icentris now. I was taking Calitra. Okay. That's the same thing that my mom, Magic Johnson, takes. Okay. And it works. Mm -hmm. But it, it helps you to gain weight. Okay. <laughs> and, it, and it's not good for, uh, well, I don't want to talk negative about that pill, because, except it, it does what it's supposed to do, mm -hmm. except for, for me, mm -hmm. the cholesterol issue. With the family history. Yeah. And after I learned about advocacy, I realized I had to tell my doctor, if it works, don't fix it, it's not an option for me. And quite honestly, most side effects last only about three weeks. Oh. Oh, and then after three weeks? After three weeks. Of... But some medications, and when they mix in with you in other conditions and your uh, genetics... For me, it might cause me diarrhea. And that's not a thing that lasts three weeks. That could, might be something that lasts ongoing. Right, right. Or uh, cholesterol, that might be something ongoing. Right. And I'm diagnosed with another thing called long-term encounter with HIV. Long-term encounter with HIV meds. Those are two different diagnoses I have right what here. What do those two things mean? I mean, I think I know what they mean. What do those two things Long -term mean? Long-term encounter means... Anytime I've taken an HIV med for so many years, 
you're going to have, that's called a long-term encounter. There are things that can come up with liver, with kidney. Like I have a 14 millimeter mass in my, in my uh, liver. After taking some medication for a certain length of time, you can have side effects. Uh, it can impact body parts. A long-term encounter with the disease could mean the HIV itself. Uh, having for a long period of time can start to impact other parts of the body. ACT UP has been around since the beginning of the AIDS crisis. Here in New York City, we're actually here at the LGBT Community Center where ACT UP first met and uh, continues to meet every Monday night. The thing we say at the beginning of every meeting is we're a diverse, nonpartisan group of individuals united in anger and committed to direct action to end the AIDS crisis. So there's this thing called post-exposure prophylaxis, PEP. And to be extremely reductive and uh, not sciency at all, uh, it's, it's a drug that can be likened to the morning after. I mean, there's this drug that's out there that, to be all the way real, people that are sexually assaulted get automatically no matter what hospital they go to. But if you walk in and you say, you know, my partner and I had a condom break, they don't give it to you because those aren't the magic words. And there shouldn't be a sentence to say that grants you access. You should just get this thing that saves your life from, you know, stigma, from having to have a really uncomfortable conversation for the rest of your life with anybody that you love. and. We're here to fight that. I got into this work with the mindset that one day we should be putting all of our, putting ourselves out of business. We are lessening the number of new infections. We are increasing the number of people in care. The AIDS Inc. as we've known it will go away. There are many people who have made HIV and AIDS their life's work. For those of us who do have a stake in this virus, we all come at it from different angles for different purposes. I think it's important we stay aware of what's going on right now before we end up passing our desired exit. You know what I mean? I guess first off we should ask ourselves, what is our desired exit? <laughs>